Hello, today we'll be discussing the Red Hat Satellite 6.2 functionality version overview. First, as a recap, Red Hat Satellite is Red Hat's lifecycle management tool for managing Red Hat infrastructure. Satellite gives you the ability to deploy a number of Red Hat products, such as Red Hat Enterprise Linux or Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization and others, on a variety of infrastructures, including physical, virtual, private cloud, and public cloud. Satellite 6.2 was recently released, and these are the major themes that included the release of Satellite 6.2. We have new technologies in the area of automated workflows, new solutions for air gap security and federation, some improvements to our software management, a number of improvements to the satellite capsule, new support for atomic OS tree and containers, and enhanced and overhauled documentation. In the automated workflows area, we've introduced remote execution. This gives you the ability to automate workflows and allow users to take tasks against multiple groups of systems. It has been extended to give you a library of job templates, making it easy to reuse and secure common commands. As an example, I can take commonly run tasks and allow a junior administrator to run those tasks over and over again. Hand in hand with remote execution is the scheduling feature. Scheduling allows the remote execution jobs to happen immediately at some future time or on a recurring basis. We've introduced new features for bootstrap and provisioning. We now have a bootstrap script, which makes it very simple to import clients into Satellite 6, whether they are provisioned via uh, a non-Red Hat tool, or those are migrating clients that are moving over from Satellite 5 or Red Hat network. We also have some enhanced provisioning options in the means of pixie list discovery. This gives you the capability to use discovery and provisioning in environments where DHCP and Pixie may not be available. So now we have a unified boot disk option that makes it very effective to provision systems and environments without DHCP and Pixie. Another new feature we have is the inner satellite sync feature. The inner satellite sync feature makes it very simple to synchronize and export content from one satellite to another. This is very useful for satellites running in air gapped environments where it is impossible to have one of the satellites connect directly to the internet. This enables export of a repository, a content view, or a repository within a content view in a full or incremental manner. Lastly, this exported content can be used by another satellite, whether that's a connected satellite or a disconnected satellite, as their upstream source of content, effectively as their Red Hat CDN. We've also made some improvements in the area of software management. We have a new feature coming called Lazy Sync, which makes it very easy to streamline our content synchronization. Effectively, what Lazy Sync gives us the ability to do is uh, synchronize content on an on-demand or a background basis. This enables you to get up and running with satellite faster. Uh, it also enables you to get up and running with satellite capsules faster. We've also significantly overhauled our UI and UX for Puppet Smart Variable Management making the ability to manage Puppet Smart variables significantly more uh, easier within the UI. The satellite capsule received a number of improvements as well. These improvements make it easier to manage larger numbers of capsules in our larger customer environments. The first area is that we have a new UI that provides health and overall performance of the satellite capsule. So it's built into the satellite UI. Uh, we realize that as a lot of customers are deploying a large number of capsules, being able to introspect those capsules and see what they're doing is of paramount importance. So now we can see the status of services on the capsule. We also can see the amount of disk space that the capsule is using, what content views are, are synced to that capsule, and if there are any synchronization jobs in process, we can see those. The lighter weight capsule functionality uh, comes with lazy sync as well. This also gives the capsule the ability to store content on an on-demand or as-needed basis which significantly reduces the storage footprint of the satellite capsule. Lastly, we have a new HA architecture enabling our customers to deploy highly available satellite capsules by putting them behind a load balancer. Uh, we support uh, HA proxy in our, in our reference architecture, but you can use any other uh, load balancer that you happen to have. In the OS tree and container front, we've introduced support for rel atomic hosts. Relatomic is effectively treated like another operating system as far as satellite is concerned. This gives us the ability to uh, mirror the kickstart repositories for Relatomic to uh, 
provision dwell atomic to patch them, uh, register their systems, treat them as any other first class uh, citizen within satellite. We also have the ability using the compute resource functionality to deploy containers on top of Relatomic. And again, Satellite is a on-premise repository for all types of content, not, including, not just including uh, RPM content. Satellite can support mirroring container repositories such as the Red Hat Registry, uh, Docker Hub, or various other third-party uh, sources. One of the other areas that we've made improvements in in Satellite 6.2 is the documentation area. So we introduced five brand new documentation guides, uh, pulling together a lot of knowledge that has been uh, in various knowledge base articles uh, in various other areas. So we have a new architecture guide, uh, which comes and gives you the ability to better plan your Satellite 6 deployment, a virtual instance guide, which is all of our knowledge around Word 2 and a satellite use case, a Hammer CLI guide for the uh, CLI for satellite, the content management guide, which covers managing satellite content, such as content views, uh, importing, uh, third-party content, what have you, and the Quick Start Guide, which is a very short guide designed to be read top to bottom to go from zero to 60, if you will, uh, in a satellite deployment. We've also restructured some of the documentation to make it a little bit easier uh, and uh, useful. So the User Guide, which is a particularly large, larger guide of ours, we split into two guides, the Server Admin Guide and the Host Configuration Guide to, to make it more topical for both the server and the client audience. We have uh, various cheat sheets available, so now we have a new Hammer cheat sheet. Uh, we have a few other topics that we'll be doing cheat sheets on as well. And then lastly, we have updated feature overviews, which show how the feature works, uh, uh, how to set it up, as well as a video on that feature. In the next few minutes, we'll be covering a demo of some of the functionality that's included in Satellite 6.2. One of the first new features in Satellite 6.2 is the Remote Execution feature. Remote Execution gives us the capability to run random remote jobs against remote systems. You can use this feature by going to the Host menu, selecting the number of hosts, and selecting Run Job. Next, we can select from a number of jobs that are pre-canned as well as additional ones you may add. As an example, we have various commands you can run. Catello options such as installing packages or removing errata, package commands to install package groups or uh, installing other packages, power commands to power off systems, puppet commands to run puppet, as well as services commands to start and stop services. For this example, we're going to use basic command. We can also run this optionally against a bookmark, which is a safe search collection of servers. We'll omit that for now. And lastly, we'll go ahead and we'll run our custom command. For simplicity's sake, we'll just ping Google. Additionally, we can select that command to run currently at a future execution point in time, as well as a recurrent execution to have this job happen on a regular basis. We'll go ahead and hit submit. Next, we can see in real time the status of the job, as well as the various commands that were asked of the host to be run. As we can see in this example, we have two hosts that have passed and one that has failed. We can go ahead and take a look at the host menu to identify which hosts have succeeded and which ones have passed. So if I take a look at the host here, Crash06, we can also see that we have the standard output of those commands captured in the satellite so that we can have it for reporting or for various other functions. We can go back to our job and we take a look at the host tab again let's take a look at the host that's failed. We can see here that this host failed because the host was unreachable, presumably because that host is offline. To customize the various remote jobs, we can go ahead and head to the host menu, select job templates, and we can see all of the built-in jobs that are included with Satellite 6.2. We can import those from disk in case they're in a uh, ERB type format, or optionally we can take one of these jobs uh, let's say we'll go ahead with the Puppet Run Watch job, clone it, give it a name, let's call it uh, Custom, and then we can go ahead and change this job to reflect our, our options. Let's say we wanted to add some verbosity to our Puppet Runs when we do them remotely. Lastly, we can go ahead and click Submit. One of the most powerful features of the remote execution functionality is its ability to load balance jobs based upon what subnet a system is running on. 
So if we actually head over to infrastructure subnet and select one of our subnets here, such as VLAN 14, we'll have a new tab also called the Remote Execution tab. Note under the Remote Execution tab, you'll see a number of capsules that can be used to load balance SSH jobs. When multiple capsules are selected, the jobs are load balanced across all of the capsules, allowing the jobs to complete faster. The next new feature in Satellite 6.2 is the bootstrap.py script. There are times where you have systems that are built outside of Satellite 6 that you wish to get into Satellite 6, such as systems that are currently registered to Satellite 5 or the Red Hat Customer Portal, or just other systems that are provisioned by a non-Red Hat provisioning platform. So to do that, we include the bootstrap.py script on every satellite and every satellite capsule. Let's take a look. So as you can see, in var www html pub bootstrap.py is where we keep the bootstrap script. This makes it accessible over HTTP from any satellite or satellite capsule. To bring new clients into satellite using the bootstrap script, we can go ahead, hop over to a client, and we can wget that script or curl or whatever other command you'd like to use to download it to the client. So we'll use wget here. Next, we'll make the file executable. And then we'll run it with some options. So one of the options that the bootstrap script requires is the administrative username for a user that's allowed to join systems to the satellite. This is done because we need the ability to properly create the host account in the correct organization and correct location. Also, we need the host name of the satellite server. If you are using satellite capsules, you would provide the uh, satellite capsule server's host name here instead of the satellite. Next, we provide the organization and location, shown by the O and L switches respectively. Next, we provide a host group, an activation key, and optionally the force option if you wish to run the script multiple times. So we'll go ahead and we'll run the script. Next, it'll prompt us for our admin username and password. And as we can see, the package is already installed, so we'll go ahead and run it again with the force switch. So as you can see here, the bootstrap script will go through and create the respective client host account inside of Satellite. It'll download the Catello Consumer RPM. It'll register the system using Subscription Manager. Also, it will install the Catello agent, make sure it's set to run on boot, and create the and create the puppet account required by the system. So as you can see now, the system stops here and it's waiting for us to uh, head to the UI and register that system using the uh, puppet certificate. So if we head over to the UI, we go to infrastructure and capsules. We'll go ahead and we'll see the, the capsules that we have registered to the satellite as well as the satellite itself. Because we registered the system directly via the satellite, we'll have to go over to the satellite CA page. Next, we click on certificates. And we can see the new client here, bootstrap3.example.com, pending, waiting for us to sign its puppet certificate. We can turn on auto signing to have this happen automatically, but for this example, we did not. So we'll go ahead and click sign. Head back over to the client. The client will poll roughly every five seconds to ensure it has a new uh, signed certificate. After it receives the signed certificate request, it will complete a puppet run and we will be done bootstrapping the client. As you can see here, the client has finished its uh, puppet run, and one of the last commands that we do is we just remove any old RHN packages that are installed on the system. That way we don't have any legacy packages uh, that we no longer require. We head over to the UI, go to the host all host page. We can go ahead and see our new client, bootstrap3.example.com, and he's set up as a normal, regular client would be. We have its uh, subscription manager config, it has a proper subscription, uh, and we've also executed a puppet run, uh, which we've approved so that the client has the ability to receive uh, successive uh, puppet runs.
One of the new capabilities in Satellite 6.2 is the Pixieless Discovery feature. Pixieless Discovery makes it possible for users who do not have Pixie or DHCP set up in their network environments to have a robust boot disk provisioning method. Pixieless Discovery starts with a new, a new boot disk designed to enable provisioning from Pixieless or DHCP less environments. So we'll go ahead and we'll start the boot from the boot ISO. Once the ISO is booted, I have the option of choosing between manual setup or discovery via DHCP. For this example, we'll use a static IP address. It'll allow us to pick from our listing of interfaces if we had multiple interfaces available. Next, we'll provide the IP addressing information for the system. Next, we'll provide the URL to the satellite or satellite capsule that we'll be using to proxy our discovery request through. Next, we can provide a number of custom facts to enable our, us to better identify our systems or to use these custom facts for provisioning rules. So in this example, I'll use a fact named billing code and just set that to department. 001 as an example. Once we hit confirm, the system's facts are reported up to the satellite or via the satellite capsule eventually to the satellite. And now this gives us the ability to take this machine into inventory and perform any provisioning tasks based upon it. If there were troubleshooting issues that we needed to take care of, such as we're unable to connect due to routing or firewalls, we can enable SSH on the system, SSH into it, and use traditional Red Hat Enterprise Linux troubleshooting tools to identify why the system was not able to connect via Pixieless Discovery. So next we'll head over to the UI. We'll head to the host page and we'll see the discovered host. And as we'll see here, our new host has shown up and we can now provision it. But before we provision it, let's go ahead and take a look at some of its system facts. As we can see, we get the traditional hardware facts such as uh, the IP address and the memory, the amount of storage that the system has. But if we also look over on our miscellaneous tab, we'll also see the custom fact that we passed in. These custom facts can now be used to, can be, be used as part of a discovery rule, which can be used for provisioning. So let's make an example. Let's go billing code search facts dot billing code equals department one. So we'll make a discovery rule that says for any system that has the custom fact billing code set to department 001, we go ahead and provision that into the crash provisioning group. Then we can pick a host name template, number of hosts we're going to provision with this rule and its priority, and go ahead and hit submit. So now we can head back over to our discovered host, and in this example, we're going to provision this host manually. So we'll go ahead and hit provision. We'll give this host a name. Let's call it web server 001. Select the host group for it. Select a puppet CA and puppet master, and we'll go ahead and hit submit. So we can switch over to the host, and after that provisioning request is submitted, the host will immediately k-exec into Anaconda's uh, kernel image and begin provisioning. So it doesn't incur a reboot to uh, provision a host via Pixieless Discovery. And as you can see here, this is a standard Anaconda-based, uh, Kickstart-based provisioning method, and this system will go ahead and provision itself uh, via Kickstart. There are sometimes or use cases where you want to maybe automate the ability for a system to provision itself via Pixieless Discovery. So in the previous example, we walked through Pixieless Discovery as an interactive fashion. However, we do include a command called Discovery Remaster, which enables us to remaster the Pixieless Discovery ISO to either fully automate the provisioning process or to, at the minimum, populate the boot ISO with a lot of uh, standard values so you don't have to type them. 
So you can run the discovery remaster uh, command to remaster the discovery ISO based upon your requirements. So let's go ahead and run that. Uh, let's see. All right. So in this example, I'm going to recreate the discovery ISO. I'm going to embed in it the uh, host name and type of my uh, satellite, as well as uh, the custom fact for my billing code and my department code. That way I don't have to type it every time. So we'll go ahead and run that script. Script returns actually fairly fast, and then we can copy that ISO to whatever storage that we wish to use. So I've already done that for another system. We can go ahead and take a look at, at it. We've booted the system from the same ISO. So in this example, we're going to discover via DHCP just for the sim simplicity of time. We'll go ahead and select the NIC that we want to use. And as you can see in this example, I have the host name of the satellite server already pre-populated. Same with the billing code that I've previously used before. And then we'll go ahead and hit confirm. And again, we can see that the system is now successfully reported at system facts, and we can log into it via the UI. So now we head over to the UI again, head to discovered hosts, and we can go ahead and provision this host similarly to the last one that we provisioned, or we can go ahead and select auto provision all to a provision a system based upon our provisioning rules. So in this example, we'll go ahead and hit auto provision all. And small error there. So we'll go ahead and just hit normal provisioning again. So again, we'll give the system a uh, host group, select a Puppet CA and Puppet Master, and then we'll hit submit again. And similar to before, if we hit over here, uh, hit over right. And similar to before, that system will begin provisioning, just like the other one that we provisioned previously. Another one of the new features in Satellite 6.2 is the new UI enhancements for the capsule. If we head over to Infrastructure Capsules, we can go ahead and see some of the new forms of communication and introspection we can do on the capsule. So as an example, I'm going to go ahead and click on my capsule, capsule2.example.com, and I can see that there's a lot more information exposed about the capsule. We now show the amount of storage that the capsule is consuming, making it very easy to understand when you have a capsule that maybe potentially needs a storage expansion. Additionally, you can now initiate a capsule synchronization from the satellite UI and not just the Hammer CLI. To check on the health of the capsule, we can click on the Services tab, and we can see the various services that are running on the capsule. This capsule is running Pulp and Puppet, so you'll only see the Pulp services here. I can also take a look at the clients that are managed via Puppet, the Puppet CA, and lastly, I can take a look at the content that this capsule has synchronized. So I can go ahead and take a look at the content view name, whether or not it's composite, when was it last published, as well as what hosts are, is it using, as well as the packages, errata, and puppet modules that are included inside of that content view. If I head over to infrastructure capsules again, we can also see this process repeated for the satellite server itself. So we click on the satellite server and we can get a better status about all of its services as well. As you can see, this satellite runs a number of features that the capsule doesn't run. And for example, DNS, DHCP, as well as discovery and open SCAP. Again, this now allows us to have further insights into the health of our satellites and capsules from a centralized UI. One of the features that you'll find useful in Satellite 6.2 is the Inter-Satellite Sync feature. The Inter-Satellite Sync feature makes it possible to export content from a satellite server for the purposes of populating another satellite server. This can be done at the content view level, the repository level, and as a repository within a content view. One of the first parameters that you may want to set or tweak is the location where the exports are going to be laid out on disk. You can do this under Administer Settings under the Catello tab. There's an option here called the Pulp Export Destination. 
I have changed this from the default to be the var www html pub exports folder. To begin synchronizing content out of the satellite server, we have to use the hammer command. So first let's take a look at the content views we have available on a satellite server. As you can see here, I have a number of content views that I can use to export the content to disk. Now that we've selected a version of the content view that we like, we can go ahead and begin the export of that content view. We can do that by issuing the hammer content view version export command. We have to pass it the content view, which in this case, we're going to use the special default organization view which represents all of the content that the satellite server is uh, currently responsible for. That is all the content that is synchronized to the library. And that will always be at version 1. So after that's done, we'll go ahead and hit enter to begin the synchronization process. We can go ahead and make a uh, change of our terminals real quick over to our directory here, the Red Hat default organization view directory. And we can use the tree command to see all the content that has been laid out on disk. So as you can see, we lay out a directory for each repository that's synchronized in the satellite. This content can then be used to populate any additional satellites. That is, that content can be exported to disk and copied over to the, the other satellite if it's a disconnected environment, or this content can be hosted over HTTP for further satellites to consume.